ever done the other. Okay. Um, you could um, begin the program proper. Today we have with us Elena. She is a disability rights advocate and she's a researcher. She's done lots of work around rights of persons with disability. And she would be engaging us today on the UNCRPD, otherwise known as the United Nations Convention for the Rights of Persons with Disability. And of course, um, trending or topical issues when it comes to rights of persons with disability. Um, so um, with the participants we have here, they'll just do a brief introduction of themselves. And then Elena, you have. Wonderful. Do I need to pick on somebody or will you introduce yourself? <laughs> The floor. Thank you so much. Well, Akansha, you can begin the introduction. After that, Mr. Gideon, and then. Good evening, everyone. I'm a law student from India. My name is Akansha. I'm recently studying in eighth semester. And I'm so grateful to the ma'am who just giving me this opportunity to be the part of this mentorship program. Hello everyone. I am Harshit Yadav from India. I am pursuing BBLLB from Guru Gobind Singh Indra University, India, and I am a first year student of BBLLB. Thank you. And Gideon, last one. Harshit, Mr. Gideon, you. Well, let's see. Perhaps he has technical difficulties the floor, right please. now. I, perhaps he has technical difficulties right yeah. now. Let's see. Perhaps he could, he could have his introduction later. So you just continue with your class. Thank you. Let's do that. Wonderful. Um, so I already got a wonderful introduction from Gladys. Um, <laughs> So my name is Alina Kahle. Um, I go by the pronouns she, her, which means that I identify as a woman. And um, I have a Bachelor of Arts in International Justice, which means that I went through the entire uh, law degree program, but in the end didn't get a law degree. <laughs> a Bachelor of Arts, and I did that at Leiden University. And I um, wrote my master's thesis on India's mental health care. Act 2017. So it's quite lovely that there's two people from India here today because that is my area of expertise. And I also have a Master of Science in Sociology of Law, which looks at how law is a social fact and looks at how law is used in society. And I have a, a, approximately three years of experience in human rights, both activism and research. Um, and volunteering and actual work. And I also recently got on board on a mental health law podcast, which is called the Legal Wolf podcast. And it has a lot of episodes, a lot of them are about um, health law, human rights law, any of that. As a quick disclaimer, there are a lot of terms which are used in this field of disability rights, which mean different things and refer to different things. So on the one hand, there's disability rights, which is about the rights of uh, people who have some kind of disability to be not discriminated against, to be included in society. There's also the right to health care, which means that a person should be allowed to get health care, um, whatever is possible. So these are slightly different. There's also health law. Health law regulates the medical sector. And forensic law has to do with basically cutting people apart to obtain evidence at crime scenes. So all of these have to do with bodies, but they're all slightly different. And we're going to be talking about disability rights, which is on the left here. So 
So our day today is divided into approximately four parts, plus a little break in the middle. I'm first going to introduce disabilities as a social construct rather than a medical construct. I'll then talk about the UNCRPD, which was the mouthful that Gladys had, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, quite long. Then we'll talk about reasonable accommodation and what that means, have our break, and talk about mental health care law or legal capacity, mental capacity, that whole spiel, um, and talk about my thesis as well and my research. So I'm going to have to ask you to get interactive every once in a while, starting with right now. If you can go to a website called menti.com or alternatively scan this QR code and then I will see you there and I'm going to ask you a few questions and you just need to put in a quick answer and then we'll move on from that. Whoops, that didn't work the way I wanted it to. Here we go. If you could go to that link and then let me know when you're there and then I'll meet you there. Is anybody facing troubles logging on? Akansha, is it working? No, ma'am, can you share the questions over here on the screen? Sure, I can try to do that. <laughs> Thank you. That's a shame. That would have been fun. <laughs> okay, here we go. I'm just going to make this big. And um, here we go. So when referring to people with disabilities, we talk about a lot of different things. So what terms are used in your country for disabled person? Just drop some words. You can do that in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Just let me know. I've heard, for instance, terms like person with disability, disabled person, differently abled person, um, specially abled person. What else have I heard? Well, there's, of course, unpleasant words as well that I don't want to bring up here. And the second question is, what words do you think of when I say disability? What, what springs to your head? Akansha, I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> When first time we heard the word disability just come in my mind, uh, someone is physically challenged, handicapped, or it might be a, something related to your mental health as well these days. Wonderful. So you also brought up another term right now, handicapped. That is a term that's used quite a lot, um, especially in the United States, I think. Hmm. Yes. Oh, wonderful. The website works. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Incapacitated, meaning completely unable to do something. Cool. We can work with that. So right now there's we, Akansha pointed out that it's not just physical disability, there's also mental illness. I mean, I, I dropped the word mental health like four times in my introduction, so that was <laughs> kind of obvious that I would go that way. Um, 
So let's go back to the presentation. You can see other screens of mine now. God, here we go. <laughs> and ta -ta. show this interview. And now I'm going to shrink this again so that only I can see my notes. Wonderful. Here we go. So there's a really, really cool book. It's a, it's a comic that I recommend reading. Um, it has a nice overview on basically the life of a person with a disability. Um, it's a comic that I, I think I sent Gladys the link so she can forward it to you. It's a super cool comic. And there's one explanation in it of different types of disability. There's on the one hand, so-called congenital disability, which is something somebody has from birth onwards. There's also acquired disability, which means that a person had an accident or an injury or a disease and now have less capabilities. There's also intellectual disability, such as conditions affecting intellectual ability or mental capacity. That can be, for instance, Down syndrome and invisible disability, which is chronic illness, um, mental illness, sensory or spectrum disorders, uh, where autism, for instance, comes in, or of course, schizophrenia, depression, those types of things. And the comic in general has a bunch of cartoons like this, which is really cool if you're looking for an overview in an animated way, which isn't like a textbook. So I promised you that I would discuss the medical versus social idea of disability. So the understanding that most of us have had from start of our education onwards is that if you're disabled, then you have some kind of illness, something is less about you that can be diagnosed. You can go to a doctor, the doctor can say, well, this and this and this is wrong with you. And therefore, the people who are supposed to be responsible for disability are doctors, special educators, a very small elite specialized group. And disability policy here is all about curing, healing, getting treatment um, to help disabled people become as normal as possible. And this model is slowly becoming less popular because we've moved on to the idea that disability is a social construct in the sense that every person has a different body and some for some reason are accepted as normal and others aren't and society is built in a way where some people can manage really well but others can't and then somehow need more assistance so the social model of disability is all about well okay if a person can't get around if they can't get on public transport, let's change public transport instead of the person. So in the UN CRPD, so how she was back, disappeared for a second. Welcome back, Hashid. <laughs> In the UNCRPD, so the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, they briefly define what disability is and say that it is an evolving concept that results from the interaction between persons with impairments and attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinder full and effective participation in society. So the UN Convention says that disability isn't necessarily medical, but social. And can somebody here perhaps name something that would count as a disability if we didn't find a way to enable participation, but we found a way to support people so that we literally don't think of something as a disability anymore? Harshit, you just disappeared and came back. Is there something you can think of where we found a way to support support people so that they don't feel disabled, even though if they didn't have support, it would be a disability. It's a tough one, but you're looking 
right at it because I put a picture of glasses and people have problems with their vision. They can't really see well, <laughs> but we've found ways to help them by literally just putting a pair of glasses on their face and boom, problem solved, no longer a disability. The thing is that we often don't consider how people with disabilities or with different bodies struggle. And I found this, this Tumblr post from like years ago. And the Tumblr post says, if you want a nice body, go get it. If you want to become a lawyer, study your ass off. If you want nice hair, pick a style and get it done. Stop being afraid and motivate yourself. And then somebody responded to it, well, that is ableist. And ableism refers to this treating non-disabled people as the standard and thinking that everybody can just, you know, if you try hard enough, you'll manage. This is a form of exclusion. This is a form of, of oppression. Because thinking that somebody can just, you know, do something doesn't recognize that people have different abilities and people with disabilities will not be able to just get a nice body if they want to. So this is quite an ignorant statement. And in the disability rights movement, there's a huge fight against the so-called ableism. So moving on, we've got a bunch of lawyers in the room. So I'm gonna go to the legal provisions and take a look at the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the UNCRPD. It was passed in 2008, so it's really, really, really new. And it has a bunch of provisions, some of which are about human rights values, just says again that everybody should live in dignity, et cetera. It summarizes and clarifies rights so it doesn't add any new ones necessarily. It just clarifies that yes, there are human rights and they also apply to people with disabilities. It says that every person should have an access to resources and be included and reminds about non-discrimination. So an interesting part about the UNCRPD is that it doesn't just reaffirm the rights of persons with disabilities, but says, for instance, if there's a mother and the mother has a child and the child has a disability and the mother needs to work from home, she's skipping work, she's about to get fired, then the employer would still have to protect her because she is the parent of a person with a disability. And now the big question, does the UNCRPD also apply to mental illness? If you go on Google, there's a bunch of questions like this. And Akansha, what do you think? Does it apply to mental illness? Hello. Hey. Oh, can you hear me? I can, yes. Oh, can you repeat your question once again? There's some network issues. Oh, of course. Does the UNCRPD, so the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, does it apply to mental illness as well? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, see what terms <laughs> is being included in this summarizing rights, human rights values, resolution, non-discrimination. These are something, a universal term which every human being needs to be accepted in the society. So obviously they apply to <clears throat> socially as well to, to the mental health of every individual because they don't pa partial with anyone. They apply to each and every one who has been part of this uh, world. And uh, the main thing which I notice in this, uh, it is being framed in such a way to cover the physical and the mental aspects of each and everyone. 
why don't you just take over my presentation? That was brilliant. That was a brilliant answer and exactly what I'd written down in my notes as well. It was a bit of a trick question, you, my question. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. <laughs> It is a bit of a trick question because exactly the UNCRPD, uh, its point is to say human rights apply to everyone. To highlight that disability isn't just a category that a person is in or not, but that every person has different abilities and those should be accommodated. So that was a trick question and you got it. And there is a huge emphasis on non-discrimination. So literally, because the purpose of the entire convention is to highlight that people are not different and that therefore nobody should be discriminated against on the basis of disability. And when I first read this definition, I was like, oh, this is, this is interesting because it really clarifies that discrimination is everything that's negative. It's, whoops, I moved ahead. It's distinction, exclusion, restriction on the basis of disability, which has the purpose or effect of impairing or nullifying equality. So if a person is uh, receives positive discrimination or some kind of assistance that's good that will help but if it's any type of exclusion restriction that's discrimination and is prohibited at the same time we, we do have to think about what this means in practice um, for instance what about if a person is blind and is not able to see and doesn't get a driver's license and is not allowed in a car would that be discrimination? Would that be unfair? And this is something to think about, but there is a clear answer that it is not discrimination. Because discrimination is everything that does not make sense when you look at the facts. So the idea is that every single time we deal with a person, with another person, we shouldn't put them in a category, but we should base our assessment of what they're able to do on their actual abilities to perform a task. So instead of saying, oh, you're disabled, yeah, you're not able to drive, look at concretely what would not make them able to drive a car. And I love this little very basic animation that I made here on the left of a, of a little um, spectrum, which shows that people are all different and adapts differently. And there is a term called neurodiversity and neurodiversity refers to the fact that mental, that people with mental disabilities or disabilities are not broken but just have a less typical version of the many different types of human brains that exist out there. So instead of saying, you know, we're gonna just draw a line here in the middle and everybody who's on the right of it, we don't allow to drive a car, we don't allow to make decisions about their own lives. We look at people as being on a spectrum, a very diverse spectrum, and every single time look at their individual assessment of what they're able to do. A core part of the UNCRPD is the concept of reasonable accommodation. And again, um, the idea is that people should get necessary and appropriate modification and adjustments that do not impose a disproportionate or undue burden. So if somebody needs help in order to be treated with dignity, in order to be included in society, and they should get assistance to do that. And here, because I said that I did quite some research on India, I pulled up a recent case from the Supreme Court of India, which was Vikas Kumar versus the Union Public Services Commission. And Harshit and Akansha 
you might know the UPSC. You probably have a bunch of friends who are preparing for the UPSC exams. <laughs> so <laughs> it's quite a big thing. So you might know the, the panic that a candidate may have if they enter the exam, they, they, they show up to the UPSC, and then their hand starts hurting. They get a writer's cramp, and they're not able to do the exam because their hand hurts. So in this case, which was in 2021, that candidate, he had such a pain in his hand and said, please, I need this one special pen. I want this one special stylus. And then I'll be able to write the exam. And the UPSC said, no, we're not going to give you that stylus. You, you won't get the pencil. Because your writer's cramp doesn't impair you to more than 40%. And your writer's cramp is not listed as a benchmark disability. And Vikas said, oh, no, 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 I'm not accepting this. And he appealed and he went all the way to the Supreme Court of India. And now the question is, how should the Supreme Court rule? Harshit, you're a first year law student, but I'm still going to pick on you here. What do you think? The Supreme Court should agree with the UPSC or should it give Vikas the stylus? Let me think about it for a second. Any thoughts? It is a tough one, but ultimately the Supreme Court said that the reasoning of the UPSC was complete nonsense. <laughs> and the Supreme Court sided and agreed with Vikas and allowed him to get a stylus and take the UPSC exam so that he can then be a civil servant. Well, I know uh, one more case related to that. It's uh, Ira Singhal versus Department of Personnel in India, 25th uh, Feb uh, 2014 case. It's recent. Yes, case. yes, <laughs> I recall that one too. Do you want to give me a summary if you remember? Uh, no, ma'am, I don't uh, <laughs> remember. Uh, full case, I don't know. It's okay, that's okay. The argument there was very similar. Um, it, it tends to be quite similar. <laughs> that the Supreme Court said, well, just because it's not listed in a list means nothing, because the purpose of the Person with Disability Act, right, that the, the main Indian disability law, is to impose positive obligations and ensure that people can live equally. So the Supreme Court said you didn't do an individualized assessment, right, I've pointed that out repeatedly, individual assessment is key, you should have provided it immediately and not like years later. And also the burden is on the denying entity. So if the candidate, because asks for a stylus, he shouldn't have to prove that he is disabled enough. But instead, the, the entity, the UPSC, should have to prove that it's too much to ask of them. Like Vikas was asking for a pen. Is that really too much to ask? And that's what the Supreme Court drew on. And in this case, it was Justice Chandra Chud, in case anybody cares. <laughs> so let's take a quick break because we also have three minutes left in this call and then we need to rejoin it. Um, so I'll meet you guys back in whatever, like five minutes. And then we'll go on with some mental health care law. See you then. Oh, ma'am. Yeah. Oh, uh, can I ask you something? Absolutely. Uh, as we all know, this global pandemic is creating a lot of fuss and a lot of difficult times for everyone. Each and every human being is suffering a lot. So uh, being a law student, uh, I would love to continue and to learn from you a lot. So is there any medium or if you could help or 
is there any possibility like anything because physically it's not possible but if there's any virtual or other things on your part you're and, asking you and, and i'm i'm saying there were a lot of lot of students out there who would who would love to work to other people mm-hmm. to explore themselves out of india but the thing is no one is ready there were other barriers mm-hmm. as well but what i found is you were very kind so i thought i should ask you out that means a lot thank you we need more kindness on this planet <laughs> i currently do not need any help however i will connect with you on social media linkedin facebook whatever you want um and then i will keep you in the, in the loop about any any things that come up and that i need help with because this is indeed uh very very lovely that we're able to connect in this way oh uh, ma'am do you use instagram i don't <laughs> <laughs> okay fine then uh, we'll connect on any social media platform which you are comfortable in sounds good i'll send you my link in whatever we're being kicked out of this room in a minute so i'll send you okay, the link okay. once we get back <laughs> okay ma'am <laughs> let's do that but you're you're in your 8th semester right uh yes i'm in eighth semester actually from the 6th semester to 8th semester i don't know what i've done wrong <laughs> i just have to sit home idly doing nothing <laughs> because of the I, pandemic i know what you mean <laughs> like everything take a back seat you're about to finish oh this is scary scary indeed <laughs> okay i'll see you back in 8 seconds